we'll just wing it, which is how we've always done it before. Do it anyway. Okay. How we do it anyway? Um, you are you in Tel Aviv? Are you in your house? In, you're in Jaffa. Is that where you are? Where Jaffa. Are you? Yep. In Jaffa. Close to the beach. The beach of the man. I was walking. You know, I walk on the beach. I either walk on the beach or I row every morning. You know, I row in a little little boat. Through the sport that you Still did the Maccabi games in. Uh huh. Oh my gosh! Back in the dark ages. Yeah, we we it was. <laughs> <laughs> we rode out, actually, the boats were hewed out of Flint. Hmm? You have continued rowing your entire life as exercise? That is one of your big things? No, I, I, I went to, I, I had an interregna of tennis and running, okay? Yeah. And then in Washington, it got to be too complicated, so I went back to rowing. At the got it. Boat. Right, but and rowing is fabulous. It's on the mighty Yarkon River. Yes, and you do you like rowing on the rowing machines too? Are you a fan of that? I detest rowing on rowing machines. I agree. Horrible, horrible. The thing. whole point is to be on the river. It's 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 communion with nature. With nature, it's 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 meditative. It's it's everything. It's wonderful and very nice people. Strangely enough, you know who I row with in the morning? No, who do you I row with in the morning? Shelly Yakimovich. Shelly Yakimovich. Oh my God, that's so it's Like one of my rowing partners. She came up to me at, at, in a filibuster at two o'clock in the morning. She was, like, the, she was the head of the labor party for a while, is that right? Labor party, yeah, yeah. She used to come to the rowing club with all her, because she was the head of opposition. She used to come with all her like security guards. And uh, she said, I heard you row, is it interesting? I said, nothing like it, you don't know. And it's like transformed her life. I mean, it is also like a cult, right? Like those who row, row and love it and go at six in the morning and other people are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, but I'm a one-man cult. I love it and don't go at six o'clock in the morning because I got to sleep. I don't know. These people don't sleep. And, and uh, rowing, now you, obviously, when you were competitive as a kid, you were in a, in a crew, right? You were in an eight-man yeah, boat. Yeah. And now it's just you and the water and a, like, it's like a kayak, except it's not? No, no. It, it, I, got, it was, it's, it, I had a skull, which I imported from China. This long thing. It's 60 feet long. Yeah. And it's got two tours. And uh, it, is, it is more difficult than it looks. It actually takes a while to learn how to do it. It's not like skiing. You got you to take lessons for a couple of months. But pe once you're into it, it's just, it's the most beautiful sport. And very nice people. And there are three rowing clubs on the Arcon. Wow. If my club and, and the other clubs, I wouldn't be caught dead in. <laughs> of course. Just like your shoal. <laughs> right, right. Well, the court I get off. So while we wait for a few more people yeah. to roll in, if this is a little bonus track everybody got of Michael. Right, or right, right. You're about rowing. The Arcone River. Well, we are going to get into talking about uh, short stories, fiction, writing, and maybe a little bit of politics. But while yeah. we just wait a couple minutes for people to come in, um, I see Mike Burstyn is in, I think, Los Angeles, maybe some other La La Land. But please post in the chat where you're, where you're dialing in from. Oh, wow. Love when the first one is from Cape Town. Um, Do you know who Mike Burstyn is? Also, if you know uh, Michael Oren personally, or me, but especially Michael Oren, please let us know if you're, you know, his relative or old friend, or maybe you hosted him at your synagogue when he was in Bath. Can I tell you a Mike Borstein story? Absolutely. So Mike Borstein is, is a very famous actor in, in, in Israel. Uh, he was acting in the 60s in this, in this series of very comic uh, movies where he played a, a, a sort of uh, ne'er-do-well uh, Haredi guy, Hasid, named uh, Kumi Lebel. Uh -huh. And every Israeli knows Mike Burns. You walk down the street. But when I came to Israel for the first time when I was 15 years old, I came to Kibbutz Gan Shmuel. And I got to the Kibbutz, and the entire Kibbutz was out there waiting for me. All right. And you understand, my original name was Michael Bornstein. So I thought everyone was out there waiting for me. I thought they were all waiting for me. And I got there, and I saw the faces fall because they thought Mike Burstein was coming to the Kibbutz. <laughs> that is such a great story and so right. really and also so Michael Oren because you were, it was filled with all those great details. Um, right. I'm sorry I didn't uh, recognize Michael Burstyn's name immediately. Um, right. All right. Well, Hello. people are still pouring in, but I'm going to get going because it's 1232. Thank you, Mira, for um, engineering. Mira Fox, who um, is uh, out in California today and doing this a half on her day off and, and managed to make it work despite the problems with Zoom. Thank you also to Lisa Lepson and Dina Cooperman from The Forward who helped uh, make this and all of our other events happen. And thank everybody who is dialing in from all over the world. It's very exciting. 
for um, for joining us. We we have been doing since the pandemic started um, a lot of different kinds of Zoom events and interviews and panel discussions, um, and it's just been both a great joy uh, for me and and a really great way of people engaging with the forward. Um, we let me just do a little bit of talkless before we get going. We, as I'm thrilled, yes, Robert Goodman, that's the question I was just about to answer. This will be recorded. It, it should be recorded. Yep, it's being recorded right now. It's also being broadcast live on Facebook right now. So you can refer any friends who didn't sign up to our Facebook page, the Jewish Daily Forward Facebook page. I will post a link in the chat in a minute or Mira will. And in addition to getting the recording sent to you by email tomorrow, you will also get um, highlights and any links that we post in the chat that are relevant. Um, all of that will be sent to you tomorrow or the next day in an email, along with a discount offer for a subscription to the forward. Um, if you aren't already signed up for our email newsletters, which are free, I'll put that link in the chat too. You need to be, that's how you know what we're up to, events and otherwise. And now I think it is time to get started or, or restarted. Um, Ambassador Oren, it's great to have you. Um, I was so surprised and thrilled when you popped up on my phone a couple months ago. We hadn't talked in a long time. Uh, Michael was ambassador to the US from Israel when I was the bureau chief uh, for the New York Times in Jerusalem. And we talked many, many times uh, on and off the record. Um, during those years to help me understand what was going on. So all of a sudden he's on my phone four or five years later and I was like, what's going on? He must have some commentary on Israeli politics or on the Israeli-American relationship. And he says, no, I'm calling to tell you that I'm publishing a book of short stories and I hope <laughs> the forward will do something about it. And I just like, I was actually in the car, so I didn't fall off my chair, but I was so surprised. I'm like, really? You write short stories too? This is a guy who you already heard, most of you, was a, a world-class athlete, uh, then an award-winning historian. Uh, after making Aliyah, became an, the United States the ambassador of the United States, then was elected to the Knesset, served as a deputy minister, um, and now I find out that he writes fiction too. So I'd love you to start by just telling us a little bit about you and fiction. Is this, where did this book come from? Since oh, when? Boy. Okay, first of all, <laughs> on here? Jody, thank you, thank you. I, fiduciary duties, my, my sisters and brother-in-law, Oren Fred Cooperberg and, and Karen Arnie Gingrist, Angrist are with us tonight, and my parents, Lester and Marilyn Bornstein, still living in the same house I grew up in, West Orange, New Jersey, married Jody for 72 years last month. Mazel Tov and just Mazel Tov. <laughs> there you go. That's like a five minute drive from where I'm sitting in Montclair, New Jersey. We are like from yes, the exactly. Stanton. Montclair Square was the place we all hung out. Wonderful. Um, it, people get it backwards. They all say, how did you get around to short stories after being ambassador and writing history and and teaching in universities? No, they got it backwards. I was a short story writer first and then I did the rest of that stuff. I started writing when I was 12 years old. I came home from school one day. I had a strange feeling at 12 years old, not what you think. I sat down and, and began to, uh, with a piece of paper, I didn't know what I was gonna write, I wrote a poem called, Who Cries for the Soul of the Pigeon, that rather depressing poem. And then I proceeded to write a poem every day when I came home, by 13 years old, I was trying to sell my poetry book in New York. And I published my first poem, believe it or not, in Seventeen Magazine. You can't make that up. And uh, <laughs> made it into Seventeen Magazine. And, uh, and I kept on going short stories. Then I got into film script writing. Um, and I, I, I wrote a film script when I was 17. It, it actually won the, the National Young Filmmakers Festival, the first prize in PBS. And so obviously I was going to go to Hollywood and I went to Hollywood for a period. You know about this work. I worked with, or I was Orson Welles' assistant in Hollywood. And um, terrifying job. Being in war was less terrifying than being Orson Welles' assistant. And I also had this Israel thing. I, I wanted to be a paratrooper. I wanted to live in Israel. And I, I had these two halves and I always tried to reconcile the two, but they were all, it wasn't as if I stopped being a writer. So these short stories uh, I wrote through five years of government where under Israeli law, you cannot publish, but you can write. And so when I came out of government, you know, it's less than a year ago, there were the short stories um, ready to go. 
So how many stories are in the collection? The collection is called The Night Archer, which is the title of the last story. And we'll, we'll get into that later. There but it is, yeah. there it is. Beautiful there cover. Is. What? Um, cover. It's like 50 stories or something, right? That's quite a 51 lot. stories. 51 stories. I had to cut it off at a certain point. And, and you, said, uh, you said you wrote it while you were in government. It's interesting. I was going to ask what you were saying that you wrote your first story when you were, or you wrote your first poem when you were 12. So one of the stories titled Afi Komen comes from the perspective, I think, of a 12-year-old boy in West Orange sitting at the Seder table, right? Um, <laughs> did you, you identify with that? Did you, yeah. uh, did you write any of them? Are, are any of these from many, many years ago or they're all really from the last five years? It's, it's, it's actually a more complicated question um, than, than you know. So I saw someone wrote in, how come Michael doesn't write a story about rowing? And it's funny, I just completed today a story about rowing because I'm well into my second collection here. And I could say, okay, I, I wrote this story this morning, but the story's been inside me for 45 years. Yep. So, so it, the actual writing of the story is not necessarily the most important act. Um, the stories, I don't go to the stories, they come to me. Um, I can be doing anything, cleaning the dishes, I can be going shopping, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a story. And I have to write it. My first reaction is invariably, oh no, that's too crazy. I can't possibly write about, you know, a tiger lunching on some poor native, from, told from the perspective of the tiger. Uh, that's one of the stories. Uh, I can't write about a homeless woman living in a car with her daughter and driving across country. I can't. What do I know about that? Um, so they come to me and, and, I, and, and I have to face the horror of that open page. And, and it's a process of revelation. The story reveals itself to me. It's great. I have so many things I want to pick up on, but I want to go back to Tachlis because in my, in my tech uh, concerns, I, I forgot a couple key things. Um, I appreciate that you're all using the chat and Harry um, Hartsack, I think that's how you pronounce your name. Yes, the stories, this is published in English. We'll ask in a second if it's going to also be published in Hebrew, but they are written in English. Michael is a, Michael's first language is English, although he's very good at other languages. Um, but fr from now forward, please, if you have a question that you'd like me to ask Michael, um, Ambassador Oren, please put that in the Q&A. If you have a comment that you want to share to everyone in the group, or even just to Michael and I, uh, you should use the chat. But don't put questions in the chat that you want me to ask because they get kind of lost in the stream and I have trouble keeping track of them. So in the same place where the chat button is, you should be able to find the Q&A button on the bottom if you're on the computer, I think on the left if you're on a tablet or phone. And um, we will have time for your questions, I'm sure. I wanna pick up on what you just said, Ambassador, um, about like the range in this collection. Um, of kind of topics and voices and settings. You mentioned a couple, the homeless mom in a car. There's also one written as a letter from the battlefield and I think the Civil War, if I'm remembering correctly. There's another one that's about lesbian school teachers in the 50s. There's, <laughs> there's some about, right. some that really feel like they come from your life, like the one I mentioned about the 12 year old right. suburban kid at the Seder. There's Israeli stories, there's American stories. I'm not sure I've ever, read a collection with with that kind of range like talk talk about that well it's intentional most short story letters and i i love short stories and there are some short story writers i i, I revere you know elizabeth Straub or or, or tim o'brien but their stories tend to be set in, in one place dealing with one set of people a war or a town in maine um and i i, I from a very early age i set out to have a, a different type of life non-linear uh with as many experiences um, I had, I was very ideological in the sense that I thought that most writers were coming out of creative writing programs and teaching in English departments. And I asked myself, what happened to those days when, you know, writers would go off and climb Mount Kilimanjaro or go volunteer for an ambulance in World War I? I mean, really have a different range of experiences. And all of these stories draw on different experiences. So, you know, Jody, I was in war a lot, more than once. Um, and so there, there, there's a stories about war, particularly one story, it's all a page and a half, you know, many years of experience of war condensed into one page. And, um, and period, there's a story about Hollywood, there's a couple of stories about Washington, about social climbers in Washington, um, about Israel, but they come from different places of experiences. So you mentioned, just for example, the story about the, the retired lesbian school teachers taking a walk on a beach. Now, okay. What do I know about retired lesbian school teachers? And the answer is this, when I went to school in the 60s, elementary school, 
the teachers I had had been hired in the 1930s during the depression. And during the depression, the school system would not give teaching jobs to married women on the assumption that they had someone to support them if they were married, right? Get this. So they hired unmarried women. And it turned out a lot of those women were gay. And almost all of my teachers in my elementary school were gay. And I found out later that some of them had some very interesting relationships, particularly with a, a principal who I revered, who becomes the, the, the so here yeah. you see the, the germ of that story. I mean, I love this answer. I knew. It relates to another question I was gonna ask or a related question, which is just, you know, we always talk about you should write what you know. And I found myself, I mean, and you are a very, you're an omnivorous person and you have had a lot of chapters and a lot of life experiences. Um, but I did find myself as I was reading thinking, yeah, what does he know about that? Or how does he get in that head? And, but you're saying they all really are from your experience in a way with some kind of projection, right? Of what it must be really like. Yeah, I, even, even the, the, the woman in the car with her daughter going across the, the, the country, it's on a very superficial level. The story is called Old Asifagus. The Old Asifagus, that was a famous, that was a favorite expression of my uncle. My uncle, <laughs> my uncle Joe used to say, oh, it's the Old Asifagus. Whatever that meant. Whatever that, that meant, you don't know what it means. It'd be pretty screwed up. It's the Old Asifagus. But it's a story about, about longing and love and parenthood and courage. And I don't think you have to actually have, you know, the experience of being in a car and being homeless to, 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 to link into those feelings. And um, I am a parent. Um, I face various periods of adversity in my life, a sense of rootlessness. And that's what you're hooking into in a story like that. Um, yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. I was wondering what the old Las Vegas was um, and I when I read it. <laughs> Um, and there, yeah, there are these like, little places where Yiddish or Yiddishkeit or Israeliness kind of pop in and you, and it resonates um, in that way. I was thinking, I, you know, I titled this talk, Fiction is Stranger, my own little kind yeah. of play on, on, on that old saw. And I was thinking about it as I read also, you know, I think one of the things people often said about your history uh, writing, particularly the Six Day War book, People, and they said, you know, you're not the only person people said this about, but people would say it's so compelling as a narrative. It reads like a novel. It reads like fiction, right? Like that's somehow my, the, favorite, my favorite compliment. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about why that's our compliment. Like why? I mean, I'm obviously a person who writes nonfiction, not not right. in book form, but um, day to day. And it's so interesting to me. Why is that the highest compliment you can give a nonfiction writer is to say it reads like a novel? And, why, and for you, how does your fiction and nonfiction brain kind of work? I also, for myself, when I have tried to write fiction, it was like a joke. I'm so rooted to my reporting and my experience. Um, but you clearly, I mean, a lot of the stuff is, is pretty out there. So talk to us a little bit about how you think of fiction and non, um, both, both in that broader context of which is better, uh, but also how it works in your brain. First of all, it may not be a compliment for every nonfiction writer to be say that their nonfiction reads like a novel. It is for me, and I'm employing, when I write nonfiction, some of the skills and tools of a fiction writer. So one of the tools that I, I literally live by, I, I'm asking myself all the time, on every page, every paragraph, almost every sentence, how am I keeping my reader interested? I'm looking for the drama in history. I mean, you gotta work very hard to, to, to dull down the drama of the Six Day War. But it is, it is, it is, it is practically, it, it leaps off the page, that trauma. And what, what characters, Nasser, Moshe Dayan, King Hussein, um, what characters? And so, you know, there is something, there is a deep fictional, there's a deep drama to the whole thing. I have no problem separating the two. I can sit down and write fiction for, a mo for several hours in the morning, because I can't use it more than several hours, and go immediately to write an article about the Iranian nuclear deal because they come from different parts. I think that the, the nonfiction comes from here up and the fiction comes from here down. And so they, they really don't interfere with one another. Um, Are you working on and, a nonfiction project now? Are you working on another nonfiction book? Yeah, in theory, I have a, a contract with the Random House to write a book about the 1948 War of Independence. Uh, and I and I write frequently. I write for the Atlantic and you know these um, publications. I had, I think, two op-eds last week, one in CNN, one in NBC. The one on CNN was about the peace process and, and the Iran nuclear deal, but the one on NBC was 
what the 21st century has to learn from the 14th century in the bubonic plague. Of course. Israel not in there at all. The Middle East not in there at all. Believe it or not, it's all about Europe and the, and the Black Death. So you can, you can do that. Different parts of the brain. Do you have, um, did you take, have you taken classes in creative writing and um, in fiction writing? No, no. Um, you know, I, I, went to, I went to Columbia College. And one of the reasons I went to Columbia College was to, to take a, a course um, with a very famous poet. Let's leave his name out of it for right now. And, um, and I, 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 I was deeply enamored of this poet growing up. And I finally got into class with him when I was 18 years old. And you had to give him poetry uh, before you started. And I got into this class and there were graduate students there and upper class people. And we got up there and this poet said, okay, who's Bornstein? And I thought, he's gonna call me out and say, you know, you're, you're too good for this class. You're too good for this class. So I stood up at 18 years old and this poet looks at me and says, what is this crap you turned in? This is kid stuff, get out of here. So what happened? I had to sit there for the next two hours. But then you dropped the um, class, you were out of it? Yeah, of course, of course. And did you stop writing poetry? Were you intimidated? No, no, I, I could, it, it's not a matter of intimidation. I have no, I have no choice in the matter. Um, this is not voluntary, this writing. Okay, yeah, understand this, this is, this is breathing, okay? This is food. Um, no, I, I, if there are young writers living out there, no, that, that, you know, don't give up. If you believe you're a writer, stick to being a writer. One of the lowest parts of my life, I, I was in the Israeli army and I didn't know what I was gonna do when I get out of the army. So I thought I applied to the Iowa Writers Workshop and uh, where everyone was gonna go, right? And, um, and to do this, I had to take the GREs. I had to take the GREs in the Israeli paratroopers where I had no time to study, no time to shower. And I, really, I hadn't slept in days. I took the GREs and one day I'm out in the rain guarding the ammunition dump and a Jeep comes by and they throw me a letter and it's a rejection from Iowa. I had no idea what I was gonna do in life. I, I, had, I had a cent. But two weeks later, I get another letter from the GREs. And the crazy thing was, I aced the GREs without studying for them. I'm not great at tests, but I aced the GREs. And I didn't know what to do. So I went to Princeton and studied Middle Eastern history. And from there, it's ah, a line from writing books ah. to, being ambassador, um, but I never stopped being a writer. And do you still write poetry today? Yeah. Tell us, you, you hinted at this, but walk us through a little bit about your writing life. I mean, you're, you're not retired, obviously, but you're not, you don't have a, full, a, a job job, right? So do you, wait, you wait, write early in the morning? You write late at night? You write at your- I write at early the, in the morning. You're in talking morning. from yeah. now? Yeah. Early um, in the morning? Like early, early the better. They're, they're, they're the sweet hours of the morning. Like what time? Um, it could be five thirty-six. And it's very sweet hour. That we're looking at right now. Mm, pardon me? Couldn't hear. Right where you are right now? Is that where you write? Yes, this is my office. My office. Yeah. Right on a laptop, yeah. like modern. Right, right, on a laptop. Yeah, straight on, straight on. Um, and uh, I live with a very, very good critic, uh, Leslie. The book is dedicated to her, and, and and sometimes she'll look at me. I I know this response. I'll give it a, a, a story to her, and she, if she says the following. You know I love you. <laughs> you know I care, but okay. But sometimes she'll she'll you know most of the time she'll say okay this 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 is a keeper. And what has been the reaction from all the the, the various people in your life life who know you as a writer of deep nonfiction history who know you as a writer of op eds? What has been the reaction to this book so far? Um, mostly good. Uh, not everybody is very accepting of it. It's sort of, they think it's like maybe the, the, the equivalent of coming out. I don't know, not everyone's very accepting of it. They, they, they want, they, they, people are a little bit uncomfortable with, shall I use a, a highfalutin word, like a polymath, someone who's doing a little bit more than one thing. Um, instead of, by the way, this is not my first work of fiction. I've, I've published two novels um, and they did not you know, win the uh, Pulitzer Prize, right? They were not They did like, not win the Pulitzer Prize. No, they were actually well-reviewed. The problem is you can't eat well reviews, okay? You can't feed your kid with good reviews. But um, no, I'm proud of these. One of them uh, is based on my father's war stories. Uh, it's called Reunion. Another one called Sand Devil, which is, a, is three novellas set in the Negev Desert. Um, so I've always been writing. It's just I wasn't always able to publish. 
Uh, so when I was reading uh, these stories, a couple of things jumped to me that I wanted to ask you about. One is there's a number of them with real cliffhangery type endings, you know, where like the whole thing changes in the last paragraph. Um, leaves you, I don't want to give anything away, but don't talk away. About, yeah. about your philosophy of endings, you know, you seem to have a little bit of, there's a little bit of a game going on there. But that's, that, I, I was very much influenced by, by James Joyce. And James Joyce, um, in his book, The Dubliners, which is in a chronological order, begins in childhood and goes to death. It's the last story. But the first story had a big impact on me. It's told from the perspective of a seven-year-old boy who's being sexually assaulted by an older man. And what's interesting about it is that the, the seven-year-old boy doesn't know he's being assaulted, but the reader does. Now this, this, when Joyce wrote this in the 20s, this was, this, was, this was extraordinary. And what you're doing is playing around with perspective. And you as the writer, you're om omniscient. Uh, and you, you can share what you want to share with the, with the reader. Now, the makers of horror movies know this very well. They know, you know, that the audience knows what's behind the door, but the poor person walking into the room doesn't know what's behind the door. Um, and you can, you can play with that in fiction. People don't do it enough in fiction, but James Joyce knew how to do it. The other uh, question I'm just put in similar vein is there are at least two stories where I there where suicide is basically there, um, and I wondered if or hinted at I guess in both cases right. Yeah. Um, one is very tricky. It seems like it's a murder, but it's going to be a suicide. I think if I understood the story correctly. Anyway, I wonder if you could talk about that at all. What what's what what uh, is there is there more to that? Yeah, there's more to that. I come from a, a family that has suffered from suicide. You know, without doing too much to add, uh, details about it, yeah, and um, and mental health issues in the family, you know, an Ashkenazi Jewish family <laughs> in America, and uh, and you know, you, there are people who committed suicide maybe 80, 90 years ago, but their decisions to kill themselves affect you. They reverberate through the generations, you know, and and so they affect me. Um. Speaking of generations, what do your kids say about the book? Um, I, I give them the stories to read and uh, they, they generally like them. I, I have uh, one son in particular, has, uh, Noah, my younger son, has, has, has influenced several stories. I'll, I'll give you just a small example. One of my favorite stories is called Nuevo Mundo. And it's, it takes place in the 1530s. And it's about a young conquistador who sets out for the new world um, with an interesting backstory. And like all conquistadors, he's out to, you know, to bring civilization to the savages, Christianity and civilization to the savages. And he arrives in a, in a, on a land where the savages are actually about 400 years more advanced than he is. So I'm sitting with my son, Noam, in, in a restaurant, and we're talking about civilizations and how they advance. And he's criticizing me. He says, he says to me, Abba, you associate civilization with technological uh, progress, but there are many other criteria for civilization. There's morality, there's art, there's, 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 you know, aesthetics. And, you know, we have a very narrow interpretation of what civilized was. And so when he told me that, this became the story. Now, I don't want to spoil the story. So the conquistador finds this population that's 400 years more advanced, but in certain ways, they're total savages. Uh. And, and that was from a conversation I had with my son. Nice. Are any of them writers? No, he's a filmmaker. The young one's a filmmaker. And uh, writer, right? You know, great. Wonderful, great, great, great kids. And I think my greatest pride is having Israeli kids and grandchildren, five grandchildren. Uh, which brings me actually to the next thing I was going to ask you, which is you, so you referred to yourself as a polymath, um, which I think is, is right and accurate. Um, but I, the other thing that I think this, this, publication really is a signal of is um, a life lived in chapters um, and the possibility of doing something new even at, and what are you, 65? Is that right? Yeah. Thank you, yes. Looking and I good. wanted to talk about that a little bit because I think for, you know, and it's interesting to talk about in the pandemic because a lot of us are rethinking everything that we thought we knew about how our life was organized. But here, you know, you've, you've certainly had a, a many chaptered life long before. But then, you know, like many people in your kind of middle age, you had a robust political diplomatic career. 
And now suddenly you're doing this. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, very personally about uh, that idea of starting something so new. It's very brave. And also what might be next? Are you going to write a movie? Are you going <laughs> to... Well, first movie? of all, I'm not done with politics. Believe it or not, I'm not done with politics. I'm still very politically engaged here and uh, virtually on a daily basis. And um, that, that's a part of me. I love the diplomacy. I loved you know, representing Israel abroad. And in my previous position as the deputy to the prime minister in diplomacy, I was all over the world. And it was just, it was fascinating. Uh, um, and I thought that was pretty, um, that's my parents actually calling me now, let's see. Um, okay, got the, the, so, so it's not, I think it's important to be able to, to be flexible and to, and to be, and be able to re refashion yourself um, in any given time, strictly in the time of, of Corona. And it's, um, you know, much, much of my work was with the Jewish world and the Jewish world went into hibernation, as you know, and we really had to start rethinking things. Even the fact that we're having this Zoom conversation. How do you market a book in the age of Corona? Really, we used to, you know, you used to do the Jewish book tour where you, you know, you, you do 40 cities in, in 10 days and then you check into to the nearest emergency room and, and that's how you, that's how you, you know, marketed a book, but now you can't do that. Now it can be like, you know, that scene in the West Wing where President Obama's doing, uh, or no, uh, where candidate Santos is doing all the um, local interviews over and over again, which is totally true to life. When I covered the 2004 presidential campaign, they do the, like local TV interviews saying the same thing. So now you can do 40 book events in one day. You just keep going, Zoom after Zoom. You can, in theory, in you theory, you can just keep Zooming. Zoom golly golly, as we say in Hebrew. Zoom exactly. Gally, Gally. We're having a Zoom gala. Um, I was making the same joke. I want to I I that you're still involved in politics, and also you talked about the pandemic. And I do want to pause a little bit on the on the writing stuff to talk about what's going on there. It's been a uh, a pretty terrible week um, in Israel. Last week, was in terms of the pandemic, I think record breaking cases, record breaking deaths, the highest in the whole since March, um, passing a thousand deaths passing, I think, 3,000 new cases a day. Can you talk a little bit about what it feels like to be there right now in terms of the pandemic and, and what, what, what you think the spike is about and what's going, what's going to happen next? It's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. And it, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint because on one hand, we have now become number one in the world per capita in terms of infections. People test positive. Um, but we are far from them in the world in terms of fatalities and people are hospitalized. The numbers are going up, but not to the point where it's actually threatening the healthcare system. And so, you, and, and we also have two large populations, strike that, three large populations that are resisting any type of lockdown. There's the Arabs, there's the ultra-Orthodox Jews, and there's the cool young people of Tel Aviv. Now in America, if you're wearing a mask, it means you're a Democrat. In, um, in, in Israel, if you're wearing a mask, it means you're old and affirm and not cool. Okay, because if you like, I live opposite the beach. Believe me, the, the young people are not wearing masks. I'm wearing a mask, right? The 65 year old guys wearing a mask uh, and, and social distancing, but these people aren't. And there are rock concerts on this beach. So we have these three populations that are resisting this. The Israeli economy has taken a major, major hit. Almost a million people uh, unemployed. We've gone from having the lowest unemployment in our history to the highest unemployment in our history within a matter of weeks. It was extraordinary and people are hungry. And I personally believe that there's going to be a great, in the next couple of years, there's going to be a, a major seismic shift in Israeli politics. Many of the people you see in politics today will not be there because they will be held responsible, rightly or wrongly. And at the same time as the whole thing you just described about the arc of this pandemic, uh, there's been this, I think, the strongest and uh, longest protest you know, external protest movement against the prime minister, something like 10 or 12 weeks running of weekly. Very money, very but, but again, big bag. I saw, I saw a survey this morning that the IDI found that one in 10 Israelis have participated in the protests. And Haaretz had an article this morning about, Haar, about Netanyahu and the, this, the crisis and the pandemic. And this I, the, wasn't, uh, there was a proposal that they crack down specifically on Haredi communities because of what you said, and he seems to have refused to do that. So talk about his uh, current situation. <laughs> the, the most important factor you didn't mention, which is starting in January, he's going to have to appear in court three times a week right, for, for several hours. And uh, that's going to take a huge chunk out of his time, but also out of, out of his prestige. 
understand it. Uh, to be photographed like that day after day in court. And, um, you know, he's, he, their, their numbers are going down. The people numbers are going up are Naftali Bennett in the far right. Um, and many American Jews do not understand that the biggest opposition to Netanyahu and the government does not come from the left, it comes from the right. And, um, and this is the reason why, contrary to many predictions about a coming election, I don't think elections are going to be held. I think everyone's afraid to go to elections. You don't think Gantz is gaining from the, from the joint government? No, right? Gantz is going down. Uh, Bibi is going down. But Bennett is going up. And everyone's afraid now of Natalie Bennett, who comes through clean. There's a great benefit to not being in this government. Mm. But who's not in the, but, but Bennett is in the, oh, right, okay, sorry. Bennett's Bennett's not in the, not the government. government, but also there are some prominent Likudniks like Nir Barkat, who you know quite well. The yeah, here's the Jerusalem, former mayor. And Gidon, Gidon Saar, who, who, who was not allowed in the government by Netanyahu, because he's a, he's a rival. And, um, you know, I, I, I've and spoken. And you, you're not in the government. Oh, I got out when the going was good. So I'm, <laughs> I'm and you said clean. you're not done with politics. Do you have an announcement? Oh, I'm not. Oh, I'm not. As you, as you hear, it's in my blood. Not, it, 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 different part of the blood, different valve of the heart that the writing is, but, uh, but it very much is. And it's about, it's about service. I, 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 enjoy, I enjoy serving this country. Much, much of my life has either been on kibbutz or in the army or in government or in diplomacy. It's about service. I find it deeply rewarding. But do you have an announcement you want to make on this on this Zoom call? No, no, no. Yeah. Um, that's fine. It's fine. Uh, no, it's, it's um, please. No, I was just gonna go. You finish. I was just gonna go to some of There's the. There's nothing to announce. There's no elections just yet. But you know, when elections come, we'll let you know. Uh, okay, great. Um, I'm gonna uh, just remind everybody that if you have a question for Ambassador Oren, please use the Q and A button. We do have a few in there, and also if you came late, just be reassured you will uh, get this recording in your email, the video of this, and we'd be happy to have you share it with your friends and your followers on, on social media. Um, and you'll also receive in your email um, an offer, a specially discounted offer to the forward uh, to become a paid subscriber and to join our free email list as well. Um, you know, before we turn to the questions, I just want to indulge, I hope I can indulge in just a little bit of a personal story. I was thinking about you over the weekend, and I was remembering that our very first weekend in Jerusalem, when my kids were five and we moved there so I could become bureau chief of the Times, we went to Kol Neshama, the, the reform oh, center, yeah. and we, where you were a longtime member when you lived in Jerusalem too. And we became, over the years, very close friends with the founding rabbi, Levi Kelman. Um, Wyman Kelman. And um, anyway, we go to, we go to show, we get there quite late and it turned out it was your kids Ufruf. And so <laughs> you were celebrating the engagement of one of your children. I don't remember which one. And there was quite an abundance of candy being thrown at the various <laughs> points. And my kids who um, had, had not, I guess, been to such a thing before, they came out and they said, I love Shul in Israel. This is so great. <laughs> we, can we come every week? Because they thought that there was candy every week, which it turned out not, not quite exactly like that. There was also quite a great spread in the courtyard, I recall, after. Yeah, it was great. It was a so wonderful place. For to my about. kids excited about going to Shul. Um, I'm going to turn to some of um, your questions now. Um, we have one from Reuben Gordon, and he says, since the majority, <laughs> there's a lot of... Uh, of perspective in the question. Since the majority of American Jews support the anti-Israel Democratic Party, has Israeli leadership largely written off American Jewish support, relegating it to superficial lip service, and now relies on the vastly larger and more loyal support of evangelical Christians? Ruben's writing from LA. Um, I guess, you know, I don't think it, it is not an axiom that the Democratic Party is anti-Israel, but the real question is, you know, has the Israeli leadership, Netanyahu in specific, and maybe also what you think about Trump, Trump on this um, sort of turned uh, much more to evangelical Christians as the, be the best, most reliable pro-Israel uh, support network in America. And I think Prime Minister Netanyahu several years ago was quoted saying that he thought evangelical Christians were a better, uh, a more reliably pro-Israel voting bloc, right? So what do you think about, is that, is that becoming even more true? Well, I, I, I take strong issue. Democratic Party is not anti-Israel. I know, for example, I know Joe Biden very well. I know Senator Harris very well. They are uh, deeply pro-Israel. Um, they will never use aid as a, a means for pressuring us. We have policy differences with them. We're going to have policy differences on the Palestinian issue, particularly with the Iranian issue. We're going to have policy differences, but you can have policy differences. Um, we have a problem with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. 
we do. We have a problem with, um, you know, supporting organizations that, that uphold BDS or, or try to de delegitimize the state of Israel. We have problems with segments of the American Jewish community which are doing this. And it's painful, personally painful for me, because this has been, I'm sort of like, in a way, the, the incarnation of this U.S. Israel, U.S. Israel, American Jewish bond. Um, and I've dedicated much of my life to it, preserving it. Um, I think that the, there are two schools of thought here. Let me be very frank about this. Uh, within Israeli governments, one school of thought says that bipartisan support for Israel and support among the American Jewish community for Israel is a paramount strategic and moral uh, imperative of the state of Israel, of the Jewish state. And we must do everything to preserve both of them irrespective of the difficulties. The second school says it's too late. The Democrats are moving in a way that's eventually going to take them away from us, not because of us, because of internal dynamics in the United States. And the same thing is true of the American Jewish community. And if we have limited resources, we should invest it in our base. You mentioned evangelical Christians is a base. Orthodox Jews are a base. There are different bases. Now, I clearly belong to the first school, but I would be remiss in, in arguing that the first school is, is, the, is the leading school today. It's the Reagan school, the, sec the second school. And we have to prove to it again and again and again and make the case. And it gets increasingly difficult to make the case that Israel should do its utmost to preserve bipartisan, bipartisan support and the support of the American the majority of American Jewish community. Um, I want to push a little is, further on uphill this. battle. Hmm? So you were ambassador from when did you start? 2010? Is that right? About five years. About five years. Just but it was about years. 10 years ago, right? That you started? I started 10 years ago, yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of discussion in the American Jewish community and in the, in the political sphere about this question of how bipartisan an issue Israel remains, how bipartisan support for Israel remains, how strong this kind of progressive left of the Democratic Party and its criticism of Israel really is, how much the ball has really moved. When I, when I was really covering in detail, you and many other people talked about what a small sliver of daylight there really was in, among elected officials um, across the parties. And, you know, with the rise of J Street and other, I mean, I just wonder, what is your assessment about how much that has actually changed? Is, is there a crisis in the democratic left over Israel or is that greatly exaggerated? No, I think there's a crisis. I mean, I'm not gonna, you're not gonna belittle it in any way. It's a serious crisis. The, que the big question is what we can do about it, because many of these factors, many of the trends and processes underway in the United States have nothing to do with us. Um, you know, we didn't invent cancel culture or woke culture or, you know, or, or you know, various types of, of threats on American campuses, right? Um, what they call microaggressions, we, we didn't invent that, okay? These are processes that are purely American made. Um, Having said that, we have no alternative to the United States as our ultimate ally. We have no alternative to the American Jewish community. We're fewer Jews than we were before the Holocaust. Uh, and, you know, we had a big controversy over here of the nation state law, and I'm sure the forward had a strong position on the nation state law. But one thing you have to say about the nation state law is, will Israel actually live up to it? Will we regard ourselves as the nation state of all the Jewish people, irrespective of how they practice or don't practice their Judaism? And I, I saw the nation said law, first and foremost, as talk about moral imperative of, of forcing us to live up to our, our historic destiny, our faith. And um, so far, we haven't done it entirely. I mean, it's interesting that you say that, because, of course, most of the coverage and critique of the nation state law was not about whether it was open enough to all kinds of Jews, but what the way it's potentially subordinates Arab citizens and Arab, Arab traditions. So it's interesting to take that perspective. Speaking of, of the alliance, um, we have a question from Jerry Haight um, asking what you think will happen after the UAE deal. And he says, will it turn out to be the panacea? We think it will be. I'm not sure who thinks it will be a panacea, but what do you think yeah. about the UAE deal? What's... It, I think it's a stunning breakthrough. I think it's, um, beside overturning the assumptions, all the assumptions about peacemaking, in the Middle East, going back not 30 years, but 50 and 70 years. And I have a, a good pers historical perspective. Jody, you, you may remember I was an advisor to Yitzhak Rabin during the Oslo period. So I go back. Uh, it's all the assumptions that you Israel had to give up territory, Israel had to uproot settlements, 
that the Pal you have to first address the Palestinian issue. All that gets thrown out by this, by this agreement. But it's also the wedding with two Ds, uh, the most innovative country in the world with one of the wealthiest countries in the world, which can prove transformative, not just for the Middle East, but the entire world. And, um, you know, I have another hat, which is I'm, I'm, I'm a consultant to international corporations. And I just coming onto this phone call, I had four hours of, of talks uh, on the same phone, <laughs> talking about how to take advantage of just the massive opportunities that have been open here, massive. So one more on politics, and then we're going to go back to uh, <laughs> fiction. But Jeff Freilich, again, another kind of question that comes from a strong perspective that I don't think you're going to necessarily accept the premise of. But he says, it's wonderful to see you again. Maybe you know him. He says, are most Israelis aware of how toxic Trump is among Americans? As an American no. Israeli living in Boston, I get a sense that Israelis are tone deaf. They don't get it. If it's not reported in our press, it, you got to give, give us a little slack. We, we're, we're dealing with a corona crisis, we're dealing with unemployment. They're not writing about Trump obsessively the way the American press does. And if anything, they're writing obsessively about here, it's about BB. Okay. So they, they're unaware. Uh, what they do see is that here's a president who has, you know, moved the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizes Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, uh, cut off, you know, aid to Palestinians who are paying uh, Palestinian terrorists in Israeli, jail, in Israeli jails, who have stood up for us day and night in the UN and have basically canceled the Iran nuclear deal, or America's participation in it, and put, put Iran on the defensive. You know, for Israelis who care about their kids and grandkids, I do, that's, you can't gainsay that, okay? And, and people, Israelis are quite naturally gonna be grateful for that. And they're gonna be concerned about a possible uh, American re-entry uh, into the Iran nuclear deal and the, the a, a recrudescence of American condemnations of Israeli settlement building and policy in East Jerusalem, okay? That's, that's, I think that's natural. They are unaware of reports say that President Trump said certain things about, you know, fallen American soldiers or, or Mexicans or anything that doesn't make the Israeli press, it just doesn't. And- um, That are anti-Semitic. Or, 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 or whatever. Way to anti-Semitism at least. We have a really interesting, I have to read this question from Grace Toy because just the question itself is, comes from such an interesting place. She says, yeah. as an evangelical, moderate Democrat, Chinese American poet and writer, and volunteer <laughs> with my local New Jersey Jewish Heritage Museum, how can I be a better ally to fight anti-Semitism? Sounds like she's doing a lot already, but what do you think? Right. I'm gonna give a hard answer. The hardest thing we faced in fighting anti-Semitism certainly among Jews in the United States and Israel is finding a common definition of what anti-Semitism is. And in the past, it was easy when I grew up, I grew up in a basically working class Catholic community and I experienced anti-Semitism every day. Um, it was a certain type of anti-Semitism. We knew exactly what it was today. It's, it's not quite so certain what anti-Semitism is. And you know, certainly among certain pro progressive groups in the United States, anti-Semitism has been downgraded as a racism. It's, it, it's not as bad to hate Jews as it is to hate people of color, for example. So we have to reach an agreement among ourselves what constitutes anti-Semitism. You know, I personally like you know, the, the European Union definition that says that denying the Jewish people the right of self-determination, denying their peoplehood is a form of self, a form of, of anti-Semitism. And I think that's, that's an important part of that definition. Um, I think we have to establish that hatred of Jews as Jews is exactly as bad as hatred of African Americans as black people or any other group or Asian Americans as Asian. And we should cut no slack. For, for, for any source of anti Semitism, do not excuse anti Semitism ever. Including That's my best, to best Trump. answer. Hmm? Including no, no, someone who supports Israel. No, for, no for Grace, is, Grace also wants to know if you ever miss New Jersey and, whether, and how has it informed your work, both in politics and writing? Uh, <clears throat> well, I miss my parents. I haven't been able to visit them. My father's 95, my mother's 92. And uh, have been able to visit my sisters. It, it, that part is very, very difficult. You know, I used to say when I was in Washington that I spend more time defending the state of New Jersey than I, than I spend defending the state of Israel. Uh, a terribly maligned state for some reason. It's a wonderful state with woodlands and, and the shore, of course, the Jersey shore. Um, but there are stories in this book that, that draw on my American suburban experience. I had a truly, you know, happy days, Fonz type of high school. 
um, with, you know, with pep rallies and cheerleaders and, um, and pizza parties. And, and that experience to me was, was golden. The, the other night I watched this, this special called Boy State. Have you watched this? Uh, no, but I read about it. It's great. I went to Boy State. <laughs> How American is that? I was, I was yeah. my county's representative to Boy State. Didn't do me no harm. I went to a, a, a YMC, a working class YMCA camp. Didn't do me no harm. Not Jewish camp, huh? No, no, no. As a matter of fact, there's one story, which is, by the way, my favorite story in this collection is the, one of the last stories. It's called The Betsy Bob. It's about four Jewish women who, who as girls, attended a very fancy camp, Jewish camp in Maine. And something happened at this camp that transformed their lives. And many years later, they go back to try to reclaim this experience. So I'll leave it at that. But I had no idea what it was like to go to a fancy Jewish camp. <laughs> and for that, I, I, I needed Leslie to, to, for whom this book is dedicated, because she went to a fancy Jewish camp in Maine. Um, a big challenge for me. I'd love, uh, if I could, to talk about the Jewish quality of the book. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's talk about, Jews. Let's, let's talk, talk Jews. The Jews. Uh, although I also, just before you get to that, I just want to okay. give a question that you mentioned your mother. Um, and Carolyn Starman Hessel says she knows, she wrote that, I know your mother's a fiction writer. Was this an influence yes, on in writing? So I didn't know that. So I definitely want to hear about that. Well, my mother, my mother was a, a family therapist and a teacher. Um, and uh, she, in her, in her spare time, has written a, a romance novel, a terrific romance novel, which I'm trying to help her get published at age 92. So if any of you, Carolyn, uh, this is for you. If anyone help Marilyn Bornstein get her book published uh be very appreciated it's it's a page turner um great so how jewish is this book it's fundamentally jewish it's inherently jewish first of all i find i find writing very jewish because writing for me is freedom but it's a certain type of freedom which is a very jewish type of freedom you know we have many words in hebrew for freedom chofesh dov atzma'ut and but Jewish freedom is not necessarily the freedom of, say, the 1960s, uh, where everything goes. Jewish freedom is, 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 is firmly grounded in law. And as you can't have the exodus from Egypt without having Sinai. And we're probably the only people in the world that actually has a holiday that dedicated to freedom. But that holiday imposes all sorts of additional restrictions on us. So and I, I think that notion, the paradox of Jewish freedom is hardwired also, I think, into the U.S. Constitution. The founding fathers and mothers of the United States, you know, knew this paradox very well, uh, checks and balances. Um, and why is that like writing? Because writing, you know, I could be anything, anybody I want to be at any time, but at the same time, I have to put the, that freedom into form. And the strictest form I know, the hardest form I know, is short story writing, which is like the haiku of fiction, it, you know, if a novelist, you, you, you can say things in 300 pages, but as a short story writer, you can say the same thing in three pages. You know, the character, the dialogue, the drama. And it's our tradition. You know, we don't have a very big plastic artistic tradition as Jews. You know, in the Bible, we built one thing that was ours, and that was the golden calf, which didn't turn out so good, did it now? And uh, we had a musical tradition, but God knows what it sounded like, really. Um, what we had was a literary tradition. And that literary tradition is overwhelmingly short stories. The Bible is a collection of short stories uh, that have meter, some have rhyme. They're, they're very economical. And they say something about the human condition. They're not just the story, they say something about the human condition. So writing is Jewish, short story writing is very Jewish. I sound like a, you know, Remember that comic routine? Lenny Bruce in the 50s, this is Jewish. Platt is not Jewish. <laughs> Lennon is Jewish, right? So you're playing into a few of the, pick, the questions we have. One is, is there humor in the collection? I, I, oh boy. I found some, but I'd like your perspective on that. And, oh, and I'll get the other one in a second. Go ahead on that one. Okay, lots of humor. Starts off with a funny story about a ghost. And uh, there's a story, as you mentioned before, about a very funny satyr, uh, about a 13-year-old kid at a satyr. There is, um, one of my favorite stories is the conversation between a failed prophet named Jachariah and God. And Jachariah is complaining to God that he, he didn't make him a successful pro, uh, uh, prophet. But the, the theme of the story is 
does God have a sense of humor? Is God funny? Because we know a lot of things about God. He's wrathful. He's compassionate. He's merciful. But is God funny? Can God tell a joke? Yeah. Other than a platypus duck. That's great. Um, <laughs> I think uh, you mentioned a few, in a few different ways or a few different times, um, how short short stories can be and how, how challenging that can be. And if I recall correctly, uh, the Six Day War book is, is um, not short, right? My next book is longer. It's Power, Faith and Fantasy is 700 pages. So talk a little bit about that. You know, you also are a master of writing op-eds, which obviously are also short, but what, what is that about for you? Why are these, is it an attention span thing or what, what, what's the magic of these short stories as, a, as an exercise, as a, as a release or as a storytelling uh, frame? It, it, it's very much related to poetry. I don't want to turn anybody off, but um, it, it's the discipline of it. I love the discipline of the op-ed form. I do. I mean, the, getting an idea. A fresh idea and finishing. It's, 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 it's what we learn in, in elementary school, you know, um, expressive, expository writing, where you get a, a thesis, you, you have a counter thesis, then you have proof, 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 and conclusion. That in 700 words is an op-ed. But it takes years sometimes to learn how to write one effectively. Um, the short story writing also. I, I, I'm all the time looking at my word count, my page count. So I, I, I mentioned today that I wrote a story about rowing and a story that's been in my mind for 40, 45 years, but the story came out 16 pages. And for me, that's a failure. So what's, what are the, a couple things off that. First of all, the, the, the book has a lot of different length stories. There's at least, there's yeah. at least a couple that are longer. So what, is your, what are your parameters for thinking of what the structure should be? And also, we had a question earlier about writing process. And I know I also asked you earlier about writing process, but I'm interested. So you wrote the story this morning. When do you go back to that story? How much editing, rewriting? How long do you work on a story? Is it something different? I will look, I'll work on a, a story usually doesn't take me longer at the most, a week, maybe a week and a half. And I'll go back and re, I'll leave it for a couple of days, go back again. And then there's the editing process when you actually have pre-publication. Um, and you have to be, to me, it's all about the story. Um, Leslie or other people I send it to to read will, will give me sometimes just gruesome, horrible uh, critic critique, but I have to be open to it. And anybody who writes has to know that that's part of the, that's part of the price you pay. Get ready for it. And, um, the, the like, writing, probably. the structure, okay. I don't know how long the story is going to be before I start it, but what I do is I, I almost, I envision somebody building a suspension bridge. Think of the Verrazano narrow, okay. You know where it starts and you know where it ends, but you don't quite know where it meets in the middle. Mm. And that's the great challenge is getting it to meet in the middle. And in between, there's, there's, there's pacing and there's drama and there's, you know, those important inflection points. And all the time, I have to ask, am I keeping my writer interested? Because writing is, 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 if there's a connection between writing and being an ambassador, it's, it's about service. The job of, of, a, of a writer is not just to fulfill the writer's needs, it's also to fill the reader's needs. And first and foremost, and you can't hear no, I can hear you. My son just got home and bounded down. Okay. And a, I'm trying to tell him that we've got 300 people on a Zoom listening to us. So. Okay, we didn't so, come running and sitting on your lap and, and, and you know, as they did in that video. Um, so that's it. it, it it's, about, it's about, the for me, it's very much about the reader. And um, I, I want to keep my writer delighted. And that's, and that's why there's also, you know, there's 51 different stories here. Right, why I, 51? I, could, I, could say, 50, I don't know, just, it just came out 51. I took off a couple. I took off a couple, shaved it down a bit, um, added one. Just the people who ended. are um, the pro Washington, the Washington D.C. becoming a state people will, will appreciate that you subliminally put fifty one in. Tell us about the, <laughs> the title story, the Night Archer. It's the last uh, story in the collection. Tell us a little bit about it and why it's the title story. It's just the title story because it's a nice title. And I must say that every book I've ever written has gone through title changes, uh, including Six Days of War and Power, Faith, and Fantasy. I, I wanted to call Power, Faith, and Fantasy, Fantasy, Faith, and Power, but my editor said, no man will ever buy a book that begins with the word fantasy. 
No kidding. Um, war seems like punting and not having a title. I mean, it seems like you had a lot of time. That, that's not really, it's like, that's what it is, right? That's about the... It was Six Days of War and the, the tub title is, you know, the June 1967, the making of the modern Middle East, but you never see in the title, the Six Day War, because right. that is insulting to Arabs. Right. It means we beat you in six days. And I wanted this book to be read by Arabs and it, it is it translated into Arabic in Saudi Arabia, interestingly enough. So, uh, and the Egyptians liked it very much too, because it was a sympathetic portrait of Nasser. The Jordanians liked it. So, you know, it what was- What did you like uh, about the Night Archer? So the Night Archer is a story that, that comes out of, it's a different type of story. It's a one pager that talks about uh, my problems with insomnia over the years. And obviously I have ADHD and have trouble turning off at night. I often say I didn't have a, an off switch. And several years ago, for reasons that are completely beyond my ken, I began to imagine a, an archer, a British long, an English long bowman at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. And in my mind, I would see him, I would see him picking up this arrow, I would see him drawing it back, I'd see the arrow flying into space and compressing with gravity and height. And lo and behold, I fell asleep. And, <laughs> and this story is a sort of pain of gratitude to this anonymous archer. Um, now, obviously, as, as an historian, because I know a lot about longbows and I know a lot about Agincourt, it was, it was uh, I, I taught military history for a long time. And including at your alma mater, I taught military history. So I know this stuff. Uh, ask me how long a longbow is. Oh, how uh, long is a longbow? <laughs> don't ask me. Don't ask me. <laughs> About six feet. But, and, and how many power it is. For, anyway, so that's the story. That's the origin I of the story. I think that's a beautiful way to end. Um, I'm going to just ask one more question, which is, is it, is it coming out in Hebrew and Echom in the night? Or no. It, 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 a kashat, kashat alayla. Kashat alayla. And um, it's interesting. I, I, sp I spent much of Corona studying French. Well, how do you pass I... Corona, right? And um, there's actually no word in French for Archer. Oh, so I guess you can't but publish it in French. No French, okay. But um, in Hebrew, it's kashat, it's a beautiful name. It's the same, yeah. the same root word, you know, as keshet, rainbow. Yeah. And uh, beautiful name, but it, it's gonna be a challenge to translate it. I translated all my other books into Hebrew with a translator, very good translations. Um, it's gonna be a challenge when you wanna talk about, for example, uh, the story set, set seemingly in the Civil War, seemingly in the Civil War. Uh, a story that may mention baseball or football. These are difficult things. I have a novel coming out in April to all who call in truth. Uh, very Jewish book again. Part of it set in a, a conservative synagogue of 1972. Wow. But it's about a, 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 a high school baseball and football coach. And how are you going to translate, you know, hash marks and, you know, line of scrimmage and left field and into Hebrew is going to be a big, big challenge. Well, we will look forward to that novel. Um, as usual, Ambassador Michael Oren, very busy, not wasting a minute um, right. of this life. Thank you so much for spending the hour with us. And thank you to all of the folks who tuned in. Um, you will get a video of this chat, of this discussion in your um, email very soon. And thank you again to Mira Fox for hosting this Zoom and for Lisa Lepson and Dina Cooperman for helping us set it up. Um, it's been a joy, a delight. So it's been a joy. Thank you, Jody. Thank you to the forward. Thank you for joining for me. It's very special. Uh, Lila Tov. Lila Tov. Be well. <laughs> <laughs>